Hey, my name is Steve, composer, engineer, and lecturer. Welcome back to the channel and your first steps into the contact sampler. In chapter three, we've been going through and scripting a basic interface for your first instrument with all the controls and the performance things that you need in order to make it very easy, very accessible, and very quick. It allows you to enjoy the instrument a little bit more and have a custom interface that you can use to access those controls quickly and really come up with some awesome sound design options for your own library. We've checked out sliders, we've checked out knobs, and we've checked out buttons. And we've controlled a number of different things from cutoff knobs, reverb effects, bypassing effects, and the modifiers like attack, decay, sustain, and release. All of these things are quite common in a lot of different libraries. So they may be things that you're looking at adding into your library as well. Now at that point, you could go through and do all the knobs and sliders you need for your interface, as well as any buttons and labels and updating values and all that sort of stuff. Everything over the last few videos that you've seen will set you up for success in that way. Now though, we wanna add some performance controls via MIDI CC. We wanna program into that library those physical hardware controllers so that when we turn up the mod wheel for example it's going to do something in our library. It's actually very easy and very quick to set up and a little bit similar to what we've already looked at so let's dive in and check it out. Okay again to remember what we've done so far so this is the Foalon library it's been using the samples that we've had from the first chapter and the instrument that we built out of it in the second chapter and this is our interface so far. Of course, I haven't gone through yet and added in all of the sliders and the extra knobs that I would have liked to have done. But of course, you could be using the same method that we use to create all these things to fill out the rest on your library. Just follow the same process and move them to a different pixel point and you'll be good to go. Now though, we may want to control one of these knobs with a performance hardware controller like MIDI CC 1 or 11. Now contact actually has a very quick learn function for MIDI CC and that's actually something I really love about contact, particularly when you're using contact with the big sample libraries, the professional commercial releases. Everyone's controllers are different. Everyone has a different number of sliders, a different number of knobs and controllers, and they're all attached to different MIDI CC values. There are up to 128 different MIDI CC channels available, which means that it's gonna be impossible to know exactly how everyone's keyboard controller is set up. There are some common ones though. The mod wheel is always MIDI CC one. Expression is always MIDI CC 11 volume of the instrument is always MIDI CC7. So in fact, if you have a controller that does MIDI CC7, you inside contact will be able to control this one because that is set tied automatically to MIDI CC7. The left and right panning over here is actually tied to automatically to MIDI CC10, the MIDI CC channel that is always used for panning a software instrument. So those sorts of values are set in stone in a way. They're things that are common across a lot of keyboard controllers and a lot of libraries. So we can leverage that for our design. Now, if I just wanted to use the quick contact system of doing it, I could right click on this control and go learn MIDI CC automation. Once I select that, I could then turn my dynamics and you can see there now it's picked up. And so I could do my cutoff with my controller. Really nice, really effectual. That's what we want to do. However, I'd rather bake this into the library itself, script it in. So I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna remove that MIDI automation. So now nothing's happening. You can see the mod wheel turning up and down as I turn it, but nothing is happening to that. Now let's dive into the script editor and let's explore a new type of callback. We've been using the on init and on UI control callback quite a bit. Callbacks, if you remember, are basically like events. When something happens, then it's going to trigger a set of code. So on init or on initialization, it's going to trigger this code to display the variables that we've created, the knobs, the sliders, and so on, and do any kind of initial things like creating the performance view, setting the background, that sort of stuff. The on UI control, of course, has been super helpful to tie functionality to these knobs. When something is turned on the UI, we want to do something to the contact. Obviously, that makes some more sense, right? Now we want to use a different type of callback called an on controller. And this is talking about a physical hardware controller. When something changes on this controller, we are going to update this contact instrument parameter. So I'm going to scroll to the bottom and I'm going to type in at the bottom here an on controller. And I'm going to come down a little bit and go end on, give myself a bit more space to work in here. 
very similar to the same sort of, you know, start and end of all of these callbacks, very much the same thing. Now, whereas with on UI controller, we've been putting the type of controller that we're targeting in brackets next to it, we don't really do that on the keyboard controller. The on controller is really only called into action once in your whole script, and we do everything that's controller done inside this one callback, whereas we've had multiple UI controls. That is often the case. There are some callbacks like on init, for example, that can only be called once. There's only one on init block of code in your contact script because you can only initialize something once. So the on controller is the same. That means we need to use an if function because we need to find out when the MIDI CC one channel is activated and if it's activated, do something specific to it. So we're gonna come in here, tab over and do an if function. And in the brackets, this time I am going to choose a cc underscore num that is equal to one, which is our MIDI CC one. So it's saying, what is the MIDI CC number? It's equal to one. Close the brackets there. So if it's that number, I want it to do something. And remember that we wanna put in our end if at the bottom. So we make sure that we're ready to go and that we've got a start and end to our function, just like our callbacks. So the first thing we wanna do is we want to change the value of that controller on the UI interface straight away with our keyboard control. So when we move this keyboard controller, we wanna update the variable. So the variable was the dollar symbol cut. That is the variable that I declared at the top here for our cutoff controller. So I've already declared it, now I'm just adding it in and saying if MIDI CC one is done, we're gonna do something to this variable. Now, what I wanna do is assign it to a value. So the assign function that we've been using is colon equal, and that's gonna assign it to a value. I want to assign it to whatever MIDI CC one is. Now I do this through an array. I'm not gonna spend time explaining arrays for you. I think at this point, it's better to just kind of copy these details down, use them for a little bit, and then when you're feeling comfortable, dive a little bit further in and find out what's making this work. For now though, I'm just gonna explore what it is that you do, and you can do this across any kind of keyboard controller, any kind of MIDI CC channel, you just update the number. So I'm gonna put in a percentage sign here and type in CC, and in square brackets, gonna put the number of the CC channel. So now that's saying whatever my CC channel value returns, whatever my keyboard controller is moving to, it's gonna update cut. Now here's the thing with MIDI CC. It's only values from zero to 127. So when it's at the very bottom, that's gonna be returning a value of zero. That's great, that's the bottom or the lowest minimum that that knob can do, but the knob can go to a million. So if you leave it at just this, it will only go from zero to 127 and barely move that knob. We need to multiply it by a factor. Now the easiest way to do this is to take the one million and divide it by 127 and then times this value by whatever that returns. That way you know how many times 127 will fit in a million and then you're multiplying it so that the highest value, 127, will be one million. You can't have dot points though. It has to be a full integer value, a whole number. So whatever it is, round it down to the closest nearest number. So I'm gonna use an asterisk, which is our common computer language for times. So we're gonna times it by something. And I'm gonna times it by 7,874, which is the nearest whole number rounded down of a, a million divided by 127. Now, if I apply that and go back to our interface, and if I move this control, you can see it updating, which is great. That's perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. However, if I play a note and move it, it's not actually doing anything. The reason is it's just updating the controller, the, the UI image of that knob, but it's not doing anything functional. We haven't assigned any function. So all we need to do is copy the same function over that we would be using with an on UI callback, but this time in the on controller callback in that if function. So in the script, I would go to where I have my on UI controller for that knob, and I'm doing two things. I'm setting the engine par, which is uh, controlling the engine par cutoff, which is the cutoff knob on the filter, and I'm setting the knob label. So I'm changing the value so that it returns something like 19.9K as opposed to 1 million. So I'm gonna copy both of those, and I'm gonna bring those down and pop them in underneath here. I'm gonna int those just for ease of reading sake. And now I'm gonna hit apply. So what that means now is that if MIDI CC1 is being changed, 
It's going to update the UI component, the knob that's on there, but it's also going to run the same function that we would be running if we were dragging that UI knob up and down. So when we go in, we can take a look and I'm just going to bypass the reverb effect so it's just a little more obvious now. I'm going to play a note and change my mod wheel. Fantastic, it's working perfectly, couldn't ask for more. Now if you have a lot of keyboard control sliders, I don't have on this keyboard, this mini one here, but on my main keyboard on my studio desk, I do have a lot of different sliders and I have some dedicated ones that are used for software instruments from Spitfire Audio, for example. A lot of libraries use CC1, but they also use CC11. They also use CC21 for vibrato. So there's a number of different CCs that are often involved. So if you have a few sliders, you can program a few of those sliders and bake it in in the script. So this could be a really great performance option for you. And there we go, MIDI CC integrated now into your instrument and you can now perform with physical tactile hardware controllers. It's a really great feeling because you can control multiple things at a time. With a mouse you can only control one thing at a time, but with multiple sliders you can be affecting all sorts of things. That is the last of the scripting stuff that we wanted to talk about. I hope I haven't burnt out your brain too much. It is a little bit difficult when you first branch into it, but hopefully this chapter and this series as a whole has given you a really good overview of the process of making your own instrument and has shown you that maybe it's not as hard as you first thought. And with a few steps and maybe a couple of rewatches of these videos, you will be able to get a fantastic instrument that is brand new and completely yours. It is an amazing feeling when you finally land that instrument and you create it and you play it and it's got all the functions that you wanted, all the UI that you've created. It's a really wonderful feeling. So I encourage you to dive in, try this out. If you have contact, this is the perfect time right now to try it out. You'll thank yourself later. We do have one more video in this series and that is to show you how to test your library and prep it for distribution. There's a particular way that we need to save it to make sure that the graphic interface as well as all the samples go together with the instrument. So do check that one out, subscribe and ding the bell so you don't miss it as the big conclusion to this series. But otherwise, bye for now and I will catch you in the next one.